Analyze Asia is brought to you by Esavel. Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams across Asia Pacific? Then you know how painful that can be. Esavel helps your in-house team by taking cumbersome tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across Asia Pacific from onboarding, procuring devices to real-time IT support and offboarding. With our state-of-the-art platform, gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place. Our team of IT support pros are keen to help you grow. Check out esevel.com and get a demo today. Use our referral code ASIA for 10% off. Terms and conditions apply. China's vision is basically to use the big data that it's harvested to enable its government to be just more nimble and more reactive to the demands of its citizens. So China's idea is, you know, if we collect enough data, we can spot problems and nip them in the bud even before they occur. Or we can spot, for example, a national security threat and nip that in the bud even before a terrorist is able to do anything. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leong, and with AI and computer vision, has China perfected the future with what happened to Philip K. Dick's Minority Report? With me today, Lisa Lin, senior correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, and now co-author of her new book, Surveillance State, with Josh Chin. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You have been a long time friend of the show since our last conversation. What have you been up to? Yeah, our last conversation was quite a while ago, 2018. So since then, I guess not too much has changed. I was covering China tech for the journal back then. Now I still write stories about China technology for the journal, but now based in Singapore because it's been much harder to get into China. Josh and I have been working on this book since 2018 as well, actually the beginning of 2019. So it's finally out. And so it was a perfect time to actually finish the book. <laughs> yes, it was about time. <laughs> So going straight to the topic, we are going to talk about your new book, um, Surveillance State Inside China's Quest to Launch a New Era of Social Control with Josh Chin. I actually read the book over the last couple of days and I thought it was actually give a very balanced view of how China is developing these kind of technologies. But today, my focus will be dealing with more the usage of the technologies itself the good and the bad, and also what does it mean for the rest of the world? Maybe to start, what's the motivation and inspiration behind writing this book? Perhaps I can give just a brief overview of what the book is about, and then I can go into the book as well. So essentially, the book is exploring the different faces of China's surveillance state, both the more sinister parts of it and then the other parts of the surveillance state that residents actually found very attractive and alluring. And beyond that, you know, we explore the genesis of this surveillance state, where it's headed, the goals that it's seeking to achieve, as well as looking at the motivations and the supporters just behind the system of the surveillance state. And sometimes, you know, we came up with very unexpected results, as, as we can discuss later. The idea behind the book really was... You know, it, it goes all the way back to 2017 when we were beginning to see AI-enabled facial recognition cameras kind of pop up on the streets of China. So Josh, myself, and our colleagues, we wrote a series of stories for the Wall Street Journal about the expanding presence of the Chinese Communist Party in both in people's lives, but also in the way that they were trying to spy and control Chinese. So it, it really kind of began there. And at the end of the series, Josh and I kind of got together and we we thought about the topic and they, we realized there's more to the topic than we actually anticipated. And we knew we needed something like a book to get it right. So that was really the motivation. Mm. And then who is the intended audience of the book then? Yeah, we wrote the book basically to inform. So the intended audience is very broad. It ranges from you know, policymakers to readers hoping to understand more about China's use of digital surveillance tools to control its population. And it's not just limited to China readers, obviously. It's not limited to people who only want to know about China because you've also seen several other... China's vision is basically to use the big data that it's harvested to enable its government to be just more nimble and more reactive to the demands of its citizens. It is authoritarian state. So by virtue of not having democratic institutions such as free press or open elections, authoritarian governments tend to be just 
less reactive than democracies. So China's idea is, you know, if we collect enough data, we can spot problems and nip them in the bud even before they occur. Or we can spot, for example, a national security threat and nip that in the bud even before a terrorist is able to do anything. History's largest ever experiment with mass digital tracking and the harvesting of personal data to manage and control a population. China is not really unique in having these ideas of using data to control the population. Obviously, we've seen it in East Germany with the Stasi and other historical events as well. I think what's different about China this time is actually having the tools to be able to do this mass data harvesting and data mining on a very, very huge scale. So it's advances in technology that have allowed the Chinese government to be able to conduct surveillance over such a big platform. Very similar to the minority report and envisioned by Philip K. Dirk. But I think what I want to focus at least on this podcast, and I've also listened to some of your interviews recently with the China Project with Kaiser. Can you talk about how the digital surveillance industry with computer vision and AI roles in China that led up to its present state? Sure. Yeah. So to understand like the beginnings of this new wave of AI enabled digital surveillance, you must really travel back to 2009. And that's when you had Stanford researchers, including Andrew Ng, discovering that they could use a certain type of chip, and it was a graphics processor, to train large data sets in order to create better algorithms. So this was essentially a watershed moment for AI and deep learning because it enabled neural networks to be trained a lot more quickly. And the biggest contribution was because it enabled the technological breakthrough, you know, AI and deep learning to jump from PhD lab research to be used in commercial applications like surveillance, for example. And even though this was a discovery from Silicon Valley, it ended up being adopted on the widest scale and with the biggest implications in China. So this moment in deep learning essentially enabled Chinese startups to be able to sell facial recognition algorithms to local Chinese police and to be able to train their algorithm on police data sets to make the algorithm a lot faster and a lot more accurate. And this really brought in the new wave of Chinese surveillance. And it's a very symbiotic relationship because, you know, the Chinese startups were selling to the Chinese police and these were huge and really lucrative contracts. And in return, they didn't just get money to reinvest in hiring better researchers to refine their algorithms. They also had access to huge police databases. And police databases in China have everything from your photo to your ID number, you know, to your who call. So they had a, a multitude of pictures that they could train the algorithm with. And the more you train your algorithm by running it through large photo data sets, the better the facial recognition algorithm gets. Hmm. So I guess part of it is, is also the industry that's grown symbiotic because there, there's really made customers over there who wants to get the data and get the action points. What are the, which are the key companies that are actually providing this digital surveillance industry specifically in hardware and software? What our research found is it's a mix of both Chinese and American companies. Both, both play huge roles. Right. The key players in the Chinese surveillance camera industry are Hikvision and Dahua, who are also the world's two largest security camera makers. And the both of them are Chinese. And then you have seen also Chinese AI startups such as SenseTime, E2, and MegV. They are providing the AI algorithms to power the facial recognition and image recognition in these systems. Huawei is also another big purveyor of these systems. And when you turn to the Silicon Valley connection, that runs very deep as well. When Josh and I ran through surveillance system tenders that were put out by the Chinese police, you often see them call for components such as like hard disk drives and really advanced chips that can only be made by Western technology makers. You know, so I would inc- include examples such as hard disk drives bought from tech companies like Seagate and Western Digital or graphic processors from NVIDIA and CPUs from Intel. So there's definitely... You know, that both American and and Chinese companies have a fair part to play and gain from the rise of the Chinese surveillance state. Mm. There comes to another point, right? What what are the biggest misconceptions on Western media about the surveillance state that China brought about? What we found from our research is, and, and this was a misconception that Josh and I initially also had at the start of the book, 
we had assumed that the surveillance state in China was all seeing, like no dark corners or no black spots in the CCTV network because state media was just trumping up like its surveillance capability. In 2017, 2018, and 2019, if you had flipped in China Daily or, or read Global Times or Xinhua or even local state media reports, you would see numerous stories about how the Chinese surveillance camera network had been managing to catch people of interest, be it a drug smuggler or a fugitive on the run for several years, was finally found by a facial recognition camera. So there was this impression that this surveillance state was just very all-knowing and minority report. There's nowhere to run or hide. But what we discovered is actually there's a very huge propaganda aspect to the surveillance state. It's essentially a modern day panopticon. The more we dug into it, the more we found that there were black spots because cameras that needed to be maintained often were not maintained well. And just if they broke, they were not fixed. So you see black spots there. And beyond that, there was a huge propaganda aspect to just every state media piece as well. Because when we were when we were trying to write this book, we realized that there was an aspect of Chinese state surveillance that was very alluring to Chinese residents. So we were hoping to find real stories of people to write out and illustrate you know, the possible benefits of being monitored 24-7. And to do that, we went through a ton of state media reports. And the state media reports had talked about how the CCTV camera network had managed to reunite a missing child with her parents or managed to nail down like a kidnapper who had taken a boy from Shenzhen all the way to her hometown in Hunan. And essentially, it was using the CCTV cameras that the police were managing to track her and then retrace her steps and nab her on, on, on the way to Hunan in a train. And it was there were so many of these impressive stories in the press. But every time I, we tried to verify two or three of them by going down to that actual place and asking around if anyone knew these families. But every time we went down, we found out that the story was either blown up in the press or it really didn't exist at all. There was one incident where we were in Hangzhou and I had seen in Hangzhou's local press that they had recently installed in this residence compound like a network of dozens of CCTV cameras. Over that summer, the CCTV camera network had managed to find missing children and, and elderly with dementia right? And then brought them home. But when I actually went there and I spent a day asking people and talking to people in the residence compound, nobody really knew about the CCTV camera system. And I even asked people like the security guard. Eventually, I went to the management committee of the residence compound and I said, you know, I, I see this p news report in the press. Could you tell me who's been helped by the installation of these cameras? And coincidentally, when I was there, I saw a video playing on the wall and the video was trying to promote this CCTV camera system to residents. It talked about like the benefits of it. And then in the video, there was a mother who who had been reunited with a child and she said she was very happy. And I, I pointed to the video and I said, can you introduce me to that lady who had a child found back? And the, the management committee the, the person who attended to me basically said, oh, that's a colleague of ours. It was, you know, we had put on a show so we could explain that in a video to the residents what, how the CCTV camera worked. Then it hit me, the surveillance cameras and the CCTV systems don't have to really be that accurate or efficient. It just has to be accurate and efficient in the minds of the people that it controls. You just have to believe that it works and that's going to stop you from, you know, robbing a store or or peeing in, in the elevator. It, it really is, you know, the idea of a modern day panopticon. And it's as much a propaganda exercise as it is like a infrastructure project. Hmm. So the irony which I've learned from your book and after hearing these stories is that some of the concepts that the Chinese adopted came from the US. Can you describe which ones of those actually ended up being adopted in China? Sure. The most basic one is that the theory underlying digital surveillance is that given enough data, you can predict how individuals will behave. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's the basic approach that Silicon Valley 
companies such as Google and Facebook has invented. When these US tech companies collect data on your behavior in order to try and predict which ads might interest you, how would you click? It's the same thing that authorities in China are trying to use data to do. Essentially, they're trying to use data to predict like what problems are there or who is going to be a threat. But as I understand, right, technology is neutral and it really depends on how governments are using them. I mean, specifically for China, I think, well, you know, I always read about the Black Mirror part of the digital authoritarian culture. Can you talk about what kind of applications in which these technologies actually turn out to be sinister? Sure. And the classic example of this is a region in the northwestern part of China called Xinjiang. Most people have at least heard of Xinjiang and have a notion of what's going on there. But, you know, for those who might be coming into this fresh, Xinjiang is basically a Chinese territory about twice the size of Texas. It's always been a troublesome region for the Communist Party. And that's because it's home to 14 million Turkic Muslims, mainly Uyghur Muslims in the region. And Chinese officials have always viewed this region as restive and prone to conflict. This is mainly because over the last couple of decades, there's, there has been waves of migration by Han Chinese from, from the inner cities in China into Xinjiang. And over the years, this has resulted in ethnic tensions and ultimately resulted in some outbreaks of violence between Uyghurs and Han Chinese. So in the last five to six years, China began a campaign to re-engineer these Muslims. They put in place a new party chief in 2016, and this party chief immediately got to work installing like huge networks of surveillance cameras and all sorts of sensors around the city. So if you were a Uyghur Muslim in Xinjiang, chances are your face, your voice, and your iris prints would have been recorded by Chinese police. Um, the way they record voice prints would be they would get Uyghurs down to the Chinese police station and have them read a paragraph from a newspaper that morning, for example. And then they install their voice prints there. And and when I talk about face print, you know, I, I talk about the three-dimensional face print where they would stand in front of the equipment and they would move their head from side to side. So the Communist Party actually has the shape of their face and the coordinates Right. So no matter where the camera is looking at the Uyghur from, be it like frontal cameras or just, you know, cameras from above, they're still able to recognize this Uyghur person instantly. And it's not just that. Many of them have had their DNA collected and had their phones scanned to see what sort of material they were circulating and reading. And beyond digital surveillance, the, the police have also gathered a lot of data by hand. So you see an example of a population data survey form being distributed and Uyghurs are asked questions such as how often do you visit a mosque? What's your religious knowledge like? Do you have a passport? The idea is to collect enough information for the police to assess and run it by a very opaque algorithm to assess if this person is a national security threat or not. And I think what's really very problematic about the region is very peripheral things or expressions of religious faith could put you in the camp of becoming a national security threat. And the idea of installing CCTV cameras all throughout the city is so that anytime someone who they identify as a national security threat passes through that checkpoint or passes through that area, it sends an alarm to Chinese police who come down and take him away, often to an internment camp. As you have elaborated a little bit on the sinister parts of this, if you were to flip it and say, how can this technology be helpful then. What has it been used for? I think your book also highlighted some examples that are in reverse as well. Yeah, so Hangzhou is a really interesting one. And you see the same surveillance systems that are used in Xinjiang being deployed in Hangzhou to for very different means. In Hangzhou, the CCTV network is used by the police to, instead of trying to spot people that they think might be national security threats, the technology in Hangzhou is trying to spot a, a broad range of people that police might think that would be un undesirable to society. For example, you know, fugitives on the run or people with mental illnesses that has that have escaped. So if you were a parent, obviously, in Hangzhou, these were the same sort of people you would want to keep off the street. And it isn't just that. Hangzhou is using cameras and they're combining the camera footage with other sensors, for example, to optimize traffic. So to make traffic flow more smoothly in a city where the road networks you know, were built 
several decades ago, but right now Hangzhou's population has tripled in size. So there's been terrible congestion in the city. A lot of the smart city applications you see in China right now utilize essentially the same elements of the surveillance state that were used in Xinjiang. And they're used for good purposes in this sense, traffic management, I think also water management as well, right? Yeah, and they don't just use it for, for water and traffic management. They use it for, for example, if there's a fire in the city, right? The CCTV camera, if, even if there's no one around it, the CCTV camera can spot the fire and immediately send an alert to a first responder to get there very quickly. The other interesting area that I want to actually talk about from your book is the story of the social credit. I think one thing I learned through reading your book is that the technical implementation for the social credit is pitched by an American educator expert in credit systems from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Can you talk about the origins of how the concept of social credit came together and what it is meant to solve originally? That's a great question. Among China's numerous surveillance programs, I I really think the social credit system is the one that has raised the most alarm and misunderstanding outside of China. And in retrospect, a lot of that is a storm in a teacup because we've realized that the social credit system has not panned out the way it was reported in the West. To understand China's idea behind social credit, you have to understand the word play in China. In China, the word credit in, in Mandarin, it just means so much more than what it means in an English dictionary, right? In an English dictionary, credit is kind of like, is defined as the ability to finance a loan. Whereas in Chinese, the word credit means, refers to xinyong. And xinyong doesn't just refer to like how creditworthy you are, it refers to how trustworthy you are. And your reputation too, right? <laughs> Exactly. So the idea behind social credit was really to rebuild like the trust deficit and moral structure within the Chinese society that had somehow collapsed in the post-Mao era. And one more thing to add is the social credit system, the government blueprint for the system was put out in 2014, but it had always been in the works in the years leading up to it. And in the years leading up to it, what you saw in China was a ton of business scandals, you know, c- consumer safety scandals. I- I'm just thinking of one mm-hmm. off my head now. I believe it was like 2009, 2010. There was a Chinese milk manufacturer who was making infant formula, and this Chinese maker was called Sanlu. Sanlu essentially added melamine into infant formula that it sold to Chinese consumers in order to raise the protein count. And melamine ended up being very damaging for Chinese infants. Like it would result in kidney problems. And eventually the Sanlu infant formula resulted in a handful of deaths of infants, right? It's just incidents like this between companies that try to cut corners in, in the name of profit and consumers that really kind of eroded the trust between either businesses and, and their customers or just people and each other. So the idea was for social credit to be this sticks and carrot system that could incentivize someone to behave better. Because with social credit, if you do something good, you know your score goes up. And it, the stick would be, you know, if you did something bad, then your score goes down. Uh, and I remember, like, we interviewed a, a Chinese official who who was behind the system, and and it's actually Lin Junyue, and he described it this way. You know, he said China doesn't have churches to enforce morality. So you can't just and you can't just rely on education because if if all you do is lecture people saying that this is how you do it, no one's gonna listen. So he felt that they had to come up with a external system to try and get people to behave right. And then one thing that also came out was I think the ACLU in the US and a lot of Western outlets always conflate Alibaba's uh, Sesame Credit or what we would call Sesame Credit with the social credit system, but they're actually two different systems, right? How does the actual social credit system actually work? Yeah, and I think ACLU was probably one of the first waves of reporting as well that came up with, I guess, which led to people having this black mirror concept of the Chinese social credit system. In reality, the Chinese social credit system is actually a system of several blacklists. And here's how it works. Firstly, you collate data. So dozens of government agencies will pull the data into a massive database so that all of an individual's information is stored in one place. You then establish a blacklist and a punishment and reward mechanism to incentivize citizens to behave. And and these blacklists are not too different from those that you would find in other countries. I think what makes China's system stand out is the implementation of joint punishment. 
if you're included on one blacklist, it automatically means you're included on another one, on a different blacklist. And that means a denial of benefits in a completely unrelated area, right? And this is called, this is scheme is basically called joint punishments in China, where the same person is penalized by several government agencies beyond the blacklisting agencies. For example, I'll, I'll give you an example of how this works out in reality. There, there was a widely circulated example of a young man in the Hainan province who wanted to drop out from the military service because he felt, you know, he felt he was not strong enough to finish it. After failing to convince him to stay, this this young man was expelled from the military and put on multiple blacklists. So not just the military blacklist, he was also put on the air flight blacklist, which did not allow him to travel abroad. He was also put on a blacklist that did not allow him to buy a house. He was also put on a different blacklist that didn't allow him to take long distance trains or buses. And he also was put on a financial blacklist, which meant that he couldn't take out loans and insurance services for two years. And beyond that, he was also barred from working for the government and barred from like re-entering college. So all this just stemmed from one incident. And that was just that he didn't want to finish his military service. So this is definitely one of the more controversial effects of the social credit system. So it, it feels to me like it's kind of a large scale implementation of the social credit using some form of blacklist and then there will be bugs and then part of the reason it lies with this set of blacklists. I think that you also talk about in the book that a story about uh, Zhuang Daohe, this legal scholar in Hangzhou and ended up he suing the Chinese regulator, right? And got himself out of the blacklist. So Zhuang, Zhuang Daohe's story illustrates one aspect of how the social credit system failed. The, in, reali in reality, there are a lot of other aspects as well. Because when the social credit government blueprint was released in 2014, it was just that. It was just a blueprint. It never gave cities and provinces a clear idea of how the social credit system should be rolled out. Like, how should you rate someone? What offenses would be considered, you know, a strike down? What could you do to salvage your social credit um, rating? So what you saw actually ha happen in the years after that, you know, the years after 2014, is you saw a patchwork of different systems rolled out in different cities and even in within different provinces. So some, some cities would have a system based on numbers, right? And then you add and plus, you plus and minus as and when someone does something good or someone like flouts a rule. And then in another city, you would have instead of numbers, you have alphabet ratings, right? Someone rated on the scale of A to F, for example. And you had different names for the social credit system like all across China. So it, it was very messy and just very inconsistent. And the social credit st system just stayed within the province or that city. It was not, as everyone believed, you know, a nationwide social credit kind of score that will haunt you no matter where you went. So the, there were, in, in reality, you know, a lot of bugs in the implementation, but I think one of the biggest bugs is just that there wasn't a consistent legal guideline um, on how social credit system uh, should be rolled out. And that's being addressed right now with laws in China. Zhuang Daohe's story illustrates a different part of the social credit system, and it illustrates something that's pretty endemic in China, surveillance anyway. Um, Zhuang Daohe's story illustrates how in China, despite them collecting so much data, there's they're often, you know, the data is stored on data islands. Government agencies, despite being asked to share data, often don't want to share data with each other for reasons being vested interests or just, you know, inefficiency or just computer systems enable, un unable to talk to each other. So Zhuang Daohe's story is this. He he is a legal scholar in Hangzhou, as you, as you mentioned, and we got to know him in 2016. Essentially, we were writing a story about the, some of the very first social credit cases in China and in Hangzhou, Hangzhou was one of the first cities that rolled out this social credit system. So he introduced us to one of Hangzhou's very first social credit cases. Later in 2019, in a very strange twist of fate, Zhuang himself realized that he was put on Hangzhou's social credit blacklist. And he realized this when he was applying to be the legal supervisor of a local hydraulics equipment company. And then when the company went to the corporate registry to try and register his name as a legal supervisor, they were told that Zhuang Daohe uh, and he basically 
is on a blacklist himself. And he was surprised because he had no idea what he did and there was no information. So it really shows you how opaque information flows in China can be as well. What Zhuang did was subsequently he went to several different government agencies to find out why he was put on the blacklist. The very first place that he went to told him that he was put on the blacklist in 2011 because he was working for a company that eventually couldn't pay its debt. So that because the company was put on the blacklist, the individuals related to the company were also put on a blacklist. But this agency couldn't tell him like which company this was, you know, and and Zhuang was like the Zhuang knew the law. He's a legal scholar. And he was questioning why eight years later, that record wasn't erased off. Because in Hangzhou, the law says, you know, if you have a strike down against you in two years, basically that, that strike down can be removed. So he didn't understand why he was still on the blacklist eight years later and why there was absolutely no information on which company it was that had, you know, defaulted on the debt. And he eventually went to many, many other government agencies and other government agencies all had no idea what company it was. Eventually, when he decided to sue them, because he just got no information, he decided he was going to sue the government agencies. They gave him a call and told him that his record had been wiped clean. So I think Zhuang's case really shows, A, the opaque nature of the system. He's on the blacklist and he had no idea he was on the blacklist. And two, the data islands right? The local government agencies had no idea why he was put on a blacklist. In theory, with the social credit system, all the data is supposed to be shared on a common platform. So every local government agency has access to that data. I guess if you look at this situation, it feels like there's within the implementation system, there's still bugs. But I want to pivot back to where we are now. I, I guess we observe how the U.S. have responded with sanctions first with export controls on semiconductors and recently also stopping NVIDIA in exporting the AI chips. Will this slow down the development of digital surveillance in China? Yeah, so the NVIDIA announcement came out of the blue and the Commerce Department said it was to prevent the chips to from getting into military hands, the hands of companies that were working on military equipment. But in reality, actually, a lot of these NVIDIA chips also go into digital surveillance systems within China. So yes, the US slapping such a restriction on NVIDIA will slow down the development of the Chinese surveillance state. And so will like the US government actions over the past five years. The US government has put Chinese companies related to surveillance and Chinese entities related to Xinjiang on what the, what you would call a trade department blacklist, the entity list. So these companies will not have, in theory, not have access to high-end American technology unless the companies themselves can get some approval. American companies can get approval to sell to them. So you'd expect this to slow down the, the development of surveillance in China. What I think what ultimately happen is I have definitely seen all these trade actions, both on bilateral actions on the side of the US and its allies. It's definitely increasing China's determination to succeed and wean itself off American technology so that it's you know self-sufficient in its entire digital tech chain. Hmm. So how are these technologies now exported out of China and where are they used now? On the last count, there was a scholar in the University of Texas who in 2020 collated where the technologies were being sold, you know, these Chinese made systems itself, where they were being sold around the world. She came up with a number and it was 80 countries across the world. And these systems are on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. So it's, and it's not just like, not just authoritarian governments buying them too, democracies are buying them as well. So these systems are definitely gradually finding their way around the world. One one example that we pull out in our book is Uganda. In Uganda, the history of its governance is that it's it's being governed now by a president that has been in power since 1986. And he basically started out you know, with a democratic bent, but across the years has just become more authoritarian and like largely clinging to power. So in 2018, this Ugandan president, Yoweri Musa, Museveni, he spent 126 million on a surveillance system built by the Chinese telecom gu- equipment giant Huawei. And you know, like a lot of the countries that basically purchase such surveillance technology, Uganda said that the system was intended to fight crime. 
But in practice, you know, Museveni has used it to target political opposition. And we saw this happen, you know, at the end of 2020 when he was up for re-election. Some media outlets in Uganda had actually reported about how protesters were pro- people protesting against his re-election because he's been in power for almost 40 years. Protesters were rounded up using the same Huawei surveillance camera system and facial recognition, and they were jailed. So it's it's definitely interesting to see how these surveillance technologies have been exported and used. So what's the future for these technologies in digital surveillance? And I guess, what are the implications to a new world order with the rise of China and the decline of democracies in Europe and the US? What we found interesting was the way that China had advertised its own system to its citizens. It had advertised the system to its citizens as a new governance model. It's basically how the evolution of technology is now giving authoritarian governments like China new tools to compete in a meaningful way with democracy because China expects that these surveillance systems and collecting enough data and crunching enough data will allow it to be as responsive to its citizens' needs as a democracy. So you're definitely seeing China's model coming up as a challenger to democracy in a time where you've seen a lot of skeptics about the democratic model in the West. And in terms of what democracies can do, you know, democracies, I think the best way, the best way to react to China's model is to be a democracy in the sense that show every time there is a failing in the West, or for example, you know, over the period of Trump's rule in the US, every time something something nasty happens, like Black Lives Matter, it gets played up in Chinese state media, gets played up on Chinese social media because the Chinese government essentially controls internet opinion. It gets played up as an example of how democracy is failing and how China's model is much better than democracy itself. So I think the best way to do it is for democracies to get their act together and be a democracy to show to Chinese citizens the positive externalities of having free speech, of having a free press, of having like free elections. I guess this is a question that will impact the rest of the world. Lisa, many thanks for coming on the show. In closing, I have two questions. One is any recommendations that have inspired you recently? So one of the recommendations I have is a book by Eric Schwartzel, and it's called Red Carpet. It basically talks about Hollywood and China and the relationship between Hollywood and China. And it's really fascinating because he brings a lot of behind the scenes kind of detail about how people like Sony Pictures or MGM dealt with Chinese influence, either in censorship or in trying to do product placement and how it's essentially changed the industry. Mm. How can my audience find you? Sure, I'm on Twitter at Lisa Lin WSJ, or you can email me at lisa.lin at wsj.com. You can definitely find us on any podcast platform. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. And of course, you can tweet to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia. Lisa, many thanks for coming on the show and I wish you all the best on your book tour and catch you soon. Thank you.